Welcome everyone um, to our virtual lounge. We love being a sponsor of the Rhode Island Business Competition. We are, I'm the executive director of District Hall in Venture Cafe Providence. My name is Tooney Shartner. Uh, District Hall Providence is behind Amy there. If you can see her little square, we have a beautiful 8,000 square feet, uh, first and second floor of 225 Dyer Street in Providence. We welcome you all to come take advantage of our free public lounge that's open Monday through Friday, nine to five. If you need to work on your pitches, uh, your business plans, uh, have casual meetings, our building is beautiful and safe. And um, our second floor public lounge is open now. We just reopened this week. And then we run our Venture Cafe, our signature Venture Cafe Thursday programming, as well as some non-Thursday program programming. But um, welcome. I also just, um, we have a wonderful program. We're part of a regional organization and uh, Roxbury Innovation Center has um, applications open for our pre-launch program. It's a, an unbelievable eight-week program that would dovetail perfectly for any of you that are getting ready to pitch in the Rhode Island Business Competition. So I'm just going to drop the link um, in the chat and um, check it out because applications close tomorrow and uh, there's only a few spots left. So um, I encourage you to do that and reach out to Amy or I if you have any questions. Um, otherwise, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Beth, uh, to kick this off because I know Dave has a lot to say tonight and I don't wanna take up any more of his time. Thanks, Tooney. So my name is Beth Carter. I'm the executive director of the Rhode Island Business Competition. Um, we're excited that we have such a big group tonight um, for this very informative event. Um, we had a great attendance at our last workshop about developing a business plan, and we're thrilled that so many of you are here tonight. Um, just a reminder, the application tab on our website is now open to receive applications for the Rhode Island Business Competition 2021. Um, last year, we awarded over $180,000 in cash and prizes. Um, the difference between last year and this year, I just want to be clear, is, is that we only have one track this year. Um, in years past, we've had two, but this year we're only having one. Uh, the application deadline is March 29th at 5 p.m. And for more information, of course, you can visit our newly launched website at ri-business.com. So now I'd like to introduce one of our co-chairs, Peggy Farrell. She is a partner at Hinkley Allen. So there you go, Peggy. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Hi, I am Peggy Farrell. I am a partner at Hinkley Allen. I chair the uh, securities practice group there. And um, I co-chair along with um, Anthony Mangiarelli from uh, KLR, an accounting firm in town. Um, we're very excited that uh, we're uh, this competition, the 2021 competition is offering a new workshop. This one is Define the Customer. This is new. We haven't offered this in the past. Our presenter tonight is Dave Lubeltic, who is um, also one of our sponsors. He's, he's known as the brain for rent. He's a one-man think tank. He, he converts obstacles into actions. And uh, for 25 years, he has specialized in helping entrepreneurs, management teams, and business owners get unstuck. Uh, if you're starting a business or reinventing your brand or rebuilding your business or incubating a concept, he will help you triage what to do first and develop an action plan out of the chaos that is swirling around in your head. And during this workshop, Dave will explain how to define a target market and the best way to promote your product or your service. Now, before Dave begins, I want to recognize our sponsors. Uh, they actually make this all happen. They include private companies, service organizations, public agencies, colleges and universities, banks, investors, and most importantly, former competitors. We're really proud that we have some winners and finalists, and in some cases, just uh, ideas that didn't make it to the top level, but were perse persevered long enough to, to be in business and be successful. And these organizations provide ongoing support, which has enabled the competition to function year to year and allows the entrepreneurs to build a business framework to transform their idea into reality. Since we were formed in 2000, so we're now in our 21st year, 20, technically, I guess, 22nd year, we've had over 50 previous competitors that are making a huge impact on economic development in Rhode Island by growing and expanding their businesses, hiring employees, and buying from suppliers and service providers in the state. Um, in addition, I want to acknowledge Venture Cafe, one of our partners that are producing tonight's event. They've been absolutely terrific. 
we'd obviously prefer to be all together in their amazing space. And we hope you'll recognize the hard work that they've done to make tonight's event great. Um, hopefully we'll be able to return to their space in the foreseeable future. I think I can almost say that now. Uh, we're also very grateful to Bryant University social media team who will be spreading the word about the competition through all our social media platforms, including Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And so with that um, information and introduction, Dave, it's yours. Well, thank you, everyone. <clears throat> um, so for those of you who have seen me speak before, you know I love interaction with people. Um, so, you know, if you've got any questions or any specifics that you want me to talk about when I get to the end, definitely, you know, raise your hand through the chat, raise your hand feature or, um, you know, jump out there. I know Anthony's always got good questions for me when I'm on a panel, so I'm expecting at least one or two from him tonight, too. All right, so defining your customer. Before we start defining our customers, I wanted to talk a little bit about your product and knowing your product. And everybody says, well, of course I know my product. It's my product. It's my service. It's my widget. It's the thing that I develop. Um, but when you're really thinking about your product and what customers you're going after, what exactly is your product? And when I work with a lot of businesses, you know, they're like, well, I make wine, I make cheese, I make widgets, I, I, you know, I have this intellectual property that I've developed, that's my product. But really, you have to start off thinking about what is your goal for your business long term? Are you going to build a business that you employ employees, you have a manufacturing facility, you, you, you grow it up? Or are you looking to, you know, be acquired by a larger business down the line? Are you looking for investors and people that are going to, you know, take your intellectual property and, and take it further? You know, a lot of times out there, there is, you know, in the, in the biotech world or in the tech world, you know, the people who invent the products and, and develop the products aren't necessarily the ones that end up selling them long term. So, you know, when you're thinking about your product, sometimes your product is the business itself. Are you trying to build up a business that's actually going to be acquired or you're trying to build up a business that is going to be invested in by a certain you know group of people so you know as you're going forward it's not always just your service or your widget so you know think about that as you're going forward and think about how am i communicating my brand my developing my brand developing my my message to the world in a way that is going to help me achieve the goals for my ultimate business. The next thing is, is to kind of know, you know, especially if you're doing um, a widget or some kind of consumer product or, or a service is, is knowing, you know, what is your, your minimum profit point? You know, a lot of people are like, well, we're going to enter the market. You know, Beth teaches at Bryant. And I've, I've uh, done many business plan competitions at Bryant, um, judging the competitions. And, you know, students are always like, well, we're going to come in with like an entry level pricing. We're going to charge almost nothing. We're going to dominate the market. And then we're going to raise our prices again. Well, OK, if when people are used to paying almost nothing for your product or service, how are you going to then down the line charge them more? You, you come in in a point where they're expecting that from you. So you really need to know what is that minimum level that you want to want to be what minimum point point where you price point where you can break even, where you can make a profit, where you want to be in the long run. And sometimes, you know, the entry level pricing is not always the place to be. And that's going to shape your features, your your packaging, your branding, everything that you do with your with your product or your service is going to be around, is it seen as, you know, a value product? Are you the BMW? Are you the Lexus? Are you the Bentley or the Rolls Royce of your product category? Or are you the McDonald's of your product category? And you kind of want to know that as you're heading in, because that's going to determine how are you going to go out and find the types of customers that you're looking for? You know, in most cases, you can come in at almost any price point, but what you need to do is look at, is there a market for it out there? And that's, I spent a lot of time talking to my clients and people that I work with is, you know, what do you need 
to make? You know, so if you're a consultant, what do you need to make to make a living? What are what do you need to meet your goals? If you're trying to build a larger business, what do you need to have for profitability so that you know investors and you know other people that you're trying to attract to you, executives you're trying to attract to your business are going to want to work for that company or invest in that company. And then that comes to the, the idea of value. Why, why should someone value your product? Why is, why is a Bentley or a Rolls Royce better than a Hyundai? They both get you around. If I need to drive from you know, my office here at Sprout up to see my kids up in Massachusetts, any car will get me there. But there's a lot big difference between driving in a Rolls Royce up to see my kids and driving in you know, a, a 19, 85 Hyundai. So, you know, know what value point you want to be at. Why will people value your, your product or your service? And that's going to help you to determine what kind of customers that you're going to look for and where you're going to, where you're going to go get them. And then the next big thing that I always say to people is, is that kind of once you know what your real product is, once you know what your value is, what price point you're coming in, then you need to start creating some kind of customer profiles. Who are the people that you're going out there and talking to? And I always recommend creating three to five specific profiles of people. So whether that be you're out, you're selling your business to investors or you're selling your widget to the end consumer, you need to really understand who are those people? And not just broad demographics. You know, I don't want to hear, oh, well, I'm looking for a 35 to 50 year old male, you know, who lives in the suburbs. Okay, well, there's a big difference between a 35 year old male and a 50 year old male. And, you know, you have ones that are liberal, you have ones that are conservative, you have ones that are golf, the ones that don't golf, ones that are into animals, ones that aren't. I want to know a lot about those people. So that I can, if you gave me that profile, I could go through my mental Rolodex and say, who do I know that fits that category? You know, years ago, I, I met a gentleman right out of um, New York, well, I think it was New York Life uh, School. He was a financial advisor right out of, right out of the, their training program. And I said to him, what makes you different? And he said, well, I help people build wealth. And I said, okay, every other financial advisor here does that exact same thing. And I said, you know, what makes you different? And he's like, well, I work with small businesses. And I'm like, okay, that narrows down some of them. But yet again, you're just, I'm like everybody else. And he had all these answers, but none of them gave me a reason to recommend him. And I said, you know, you're going to walk away from me and I'm going to forget you. Just like I forgot every other financial advisor that was here tonight. Because you all are wearing the same blue tie and you all say basically the same thing. So say something different. And I said, and he's like, well, so what should I say? And I said, well, you're going to tell people that you're the financial advisor to florists. And he said, why? And he said, I don't know, because I just thought of it. And so somebody walked up to us and they're like, so what do you do? And he's like, well, I'm the financial advisor to Floris. And they were like, well, why do you do that? And he's like, I don't know, because Dave just told me to say that. But all of a sudden, people were interested in him. All of a sudden, they weren't that, oh, I got, I, I'm all set. I got a financial advisor. I'm, I'm, I'm all set. There was a reason to talk to him. And more importantly, that person was thinking through their head on who do, who's my florist and should I introduce this person to them? You know, and I've met many advisors over the years that I've worked with, you know, some that have special, uh, specialized in working with families that have special needs children or, you know, people that I had one gentleman who he wanted to work with uh, people in the 128 belt, you know, um, biotech people out of out of um, the universities and engineers and stuff, and and so he had a he had an interesting one where he said, "I work with people who have high IQs," and that was his stick. He would tell people, "I'm an I'm an advisor to people with high IQs," and it started the conversation, you know. And it's funny because people would meet him and like, "Oh, you can't work with me because I don't have a high IQ," and it was a big joke and everybody laughed, but everybody was able to start thinking about who do I introduce this gentleman to? And that's what you want. As you're starting to talk out there, you wanna have these clear defined profiles of customers that you, you can put in front of anybody and they can go through their Rolodex, both mental and physical and say, I know somebody that meets that criteria, that's interested in those things. And the more detailed you can be, the more you can you know, understand what they are, and yeah, you know, you might say, I want Harvard graduates. Well, you know, maybe I don't know a Harvard graduate that drives a 
drives a Tesla and also golfs and has a Chihuahua. But I know somebody who went to Yale and drives a Prius and has a pug. They're close. Would you like to meet them? And that's that's the idea of it is you want to really understand who your customers are and what they're looking or what they're about. Because in this day and age of big data, you can find anybody. You can, you know, pinpoint target people on social media. You can, you know, get mailing lists and, you know, even, even you know, television. You, you know, they have reams and reams of data of who watches different kinds of shows, you know, um, and, you know, not to get into politics, but, you know, the po political world is known for a long time. They know if we advertise on this particular show, it's going to be more, you know, people will be more inclined to vote for our candidate. And I'm not even talking like polarized media outlets. I'm talking your regular average TV show. They know people who watch this tend to be the audience we're going after. So the more you know, specifically, the more you can talk directly to those people. The next thing you need to do is you need to def define the problems that you solve for that customer. You know, everybody thinks they have the best widget. They, you know, I, I, I've, I've got the newest thing since sliced bread. Well, are you actually solving that problem? And, you know, I've done a lot of research with different inventors over the years. And, you know, once you really get out there and you see, do people need this or do people even have this problem? You know, a year or so ago, and I talked about it when I was on a panel um, last year, I think, um, was, you know, I worked with this person who had invented a better pet product. And because of non-disclosure, can't tell you what it was, but it was a great idea. But the problem with it is, is that we did some research and we found out that nobody had the problem that this thing solved. It was a great product. It was a great idea, but they were going to have to spend a lot of marketing money just convincing people that they had this problem. You know, and you see it. Drug companies do it all the time. It, you know, we, restless leg syndrome was you know kind of invented to sell some, you know, pharmaceutical. You know, pharmaceuticals do it where they you know they they come up with what it solves and then they cr create the disease to solve it sometimes. But you know, you have if you don't have a budget of a large pharmaceutical company, are you gonna actually be able to get out there? And this inventor decided that it wasn't worth it, that the market that we found for them was so small, they weren't gonna be able to sell enough of that product to justify the expense of R&D and the expense of mold manufacturing and the IP lawyers and all of the things that they needed to do to get a return on the investment. And in order to get it to the general public, they were gonna to have to spend a lot of marketing money and they just decided to shelve it for a while. Now, maybe, you know, two or three years down the line, they did actually do some trademark, uh, some patenting on it so that, you know, they, they had some protection from somebody else bringing it to market. Um, but besides that, they're kind of just sitting on the product to see if all of a sudden the general public sees that problem and is able to buy that problem. So, you know, as you're out there and you're looking for your customers, you have to say, do, do the people out there actually have this problem? Or am I solving a problem that no one has? Or am I sol or does my product solve a problem that I didn't even think it solved? And that's where research comes in. You know, there's many ways to get out there and do research. Um, but my favorite one is to actually use search engines. If you think about a search engine, search engine is a answer to a problem. We go to our search engines every single day and we ask them a question. We say, I have this problem. I need a pizza in downtown Providence on a Wednesday afternoon. And you know, with COVID, not all the restaurants are open, but guess what? Google, Bing, they all tell me these are what are ones that are open. Here's the pizza places that are open. So everybody is going to a search engine with a problem. So if you reverse engineer that and you say, okay, Here's the problems I think people have that my product solves. How many people are actually searching that? And that's the great thing. There's so many good tools, you know, in, in Google. And if you don't know how to use them, there, um, contact me and I can set you up with people who do. But there's so many tools for AdWords and other ways of advertising in, in the Google space and in social media and stuff 
that you can actually look up and say, how many people say, I have this problem with my dog? And it'll tell you. This many people search it in, you know, in a month. This many people search it in a year. Um, you know, there are a lot of really skilled people out there that know how to work those tools much better. They have their other um, expensive softwares that mine it all and can give you uh, detailed reports. Um, I've got somebody that I rely on regularly and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll send him a whole list of stuff and he'll, he'll get back to me, you know, and for a few hundred dollars, he gives me a report because he runs it through his system. But you, it, it doesn't have to cost you anything. You can actually go out there and do it yourself using the, you know, off the shelf tools that Google um, puts out there for you. So using that, looking at, you know, the Facebook tools, if you're a business owner and you have a business page, Facebook is always asking you to boost a post and, you know, and, and put, you know, put it out there to particular people, play around with it, see how many people meet the demographic. You know, we talked about the, you know, 50 year old man who drives a Prius that has the Chihuahua and whatever. Well, you can start using something like Facebook to determine, do those people exist? Because if you, you know, if they drive a Tesla, they probably are liking Tesla on Facebook and they're probably also liking a certain dog breed or whatever. Um, so you can put those criteria in. I want people who like zombie movies and live in the Providence area. You know, I use that. I, I did work for Converita Farms out in Cranston and, you know, we were doing the stuff for their um, scary acres and we put in advertised to these people who like zombie movies and um, those couple of ho other horror genres and things, but we created a profile. Of, this is what people who come to, you know, come over and over again. You get general families that came, but there were hardcore people that came two and three times a weekend to, to Scary Acres. And so we were able to advertise out to them based on these certain criteria. So there's so many tools out there for you to, to get kind of an idea before you even make a, a single product is my product got customers. Um, the other one that most people forget, and but there is a group of people who have been trained to research and they're located in everybody's town, in every university, it's a librarian. Go see your local librarian and talk to them because those people, men and women have been spent years learning how to research, how to look at data and how to look at what's not only in books, but on the internet now, you know, a lot of them have great resources that they can provide you. Go talk to them and they may be able to provide you with information on potential customers and potential research for your products and services that you would maybe be able to find on your own. So I, I highly recommend getting to know your local reference librarians and in, in your towns or in your, uh, in your uni local universities, because they're a valuable tool for research on your customers and, and products and what's out there. Um, the other one is, is look at your competition. What is your competition doing that, you know, do you have competition? A lot of people like, I, you know, I get all the time. I've invented this product and we have absolutely no competition. And in a, 30 second internet search, I find five things that compete with it. Sometimes they're direct competition and other times it's not. You know, is television and movie theaters in competition? Yeah, we've got this huge fight right now of streaming services versus running things in theaters. Things like HBO Max are running first run movies now. What's that gonna do to that whole industry? But that's a competition. You know, I'm going to sit home and watch Netflix and not go to the movies. You know, in this COVID world, it's completely different. But before that, you know, those were big, com that was a big competition. But also was playing pool and going and seeing a band. And there's so many things that people don't think of their direct competition. They think, I run the Lowe's Theater in, you know, Smithfield or the CW in, in Lincoln. And that's direct competition with the showcase in Providence. Well, yeah, the two theaters are in competition, but there's also Dave and Buster's that competes for my attention when I come up the top of the escalator at the Providence Place Mall. So, you know, just because you think that um, you have no competition or your competition is those specific people, doesn't mean that there's not competition out there that is somebody that you didn't think of. 
So know who your specific competition is. Next thing you should really do is, is after you do kind of your research and you see is there customers out there and you've got the profiles and you know that they're out there, is do a minimal viable product. You know, in the in the tech world, you know, that that was a hot thing that everybody talked about was a minimal, minimal viable product. What's the least thing we can do to get it out the door and see, you know, do people want to buy it? Um, is it something that people are interested in? Does it work? You know, create a minimal viable product and run a test. And sometimes you don't even have to create an actual product. You can create a prototype of it and run like a Kickstarter, or you can, you know, advertise to a very small market. You know, I, I know a number of people that have used Kickstarter and they set a really high level um, for the dollar value so that you know, if they get that money, great, they've got a whole bunch of money to produce the product. But more importantly, they can judge what is the customer demand out there? Are people actually interested in this product or service? So, you know, get out there, get on social media, talk to people, um, you know, try and see are people actually buying it? And then if you can do a short run, small run of it, get it into the hands of people. Now, I'm working with a, 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 a couple of gentlemen who want to start um, a craft brewery, you know, and I'm like, do contract brewing, go talk to other brewers and see if they can brew the beer for you and brew as small amount of cans as you can. And then take them around and, you know, get them in the hands of people and see what people think of them, see what people think of your recipes before you buy tanks and rent a space and build a tap room and all of that kind of stuff. See if you've actually got something that's different than everybody else. And that gets to my next piece, you know, as for those of you who got on early, we were, you know, I do a thing called advisor tribes and we we're talking about the, the difference between the word tribe and community and is tribe politically correct and stuff and we won't get into that discussion right now, but you need to build a community, you need to build a group of people, a tribe, whatever you want to call it around your product. They're the faster that you can build a group of people who are excited about what you're trying to do and that can help you to build your concept, get your idea out there, and more importantly, spread the word, the better. You know, so, so reach out to people that you know. Go, you know. go on LinkedIn and look at you know, your connections. Go on Facebook and find your friends from high school and grammar school and stuff and, and see if they might be interested in what you're doing and reach out to them and start trying to build a community around what you're trying to do. Because the more you have people to help you get your product and your service out there, the better. You know, we live in, in a world now where, you know, hundreds of people, you know, I can in one click talk to 1100 people on Facebook right now. You know, a lot of you, the faces I see here are all people that I personally invited to come here tonight using LinkedIn and Facebook. You know, I talked to, with the, with the overlap, I probably talked to about 1500 to 1800 people invited in to come tonight. Did all 1800 people come? No, but, my community came out to hear what I had to say tonight. And, and that's the thing, the more you have a community, the more you have those people that you can talk to, the more chance you're going to be successful. It also is gonna help you when you need to recruit salespeople, production workers, whatever the case may be, whatever you need to build your business, having a good community around you, that's gonna help you get to those employees you're gonna to have to hire or those investors that you wanna to talk to. Um, you know, start early on building your community around your business and around your products and services so that you can have that customers. And like I said in the beginning, your customers aren't just the people buying your widget. They're your investors. They're your employees. You know, you, you have to go out and recruit employees if you're going to grow a business that has more than just yourself. So they're a customer of sorts that you're going to need to get excited about your product and get excited about your business. And that gets to the next thing. Viral word of mouth takes a heck of a lot of effort. You know, the hardest thing you can do is try and make something go viral. It doesn't work. You know, no one ever sat around a table and said, hey, let's make this viral video. And it actually became viral. Usually what happens is, is that serendipity 
kicks in and something happens where people jump on it. But you can jumpstart the chances of something going viral or things creating word of mouth by building that community. The more you have people behind you, the better chance you're gonna be to getting that message out there and people talking about you. And last but not least, do good work, make good products. The better your stuff is and the more people can get excited about it, the more they're gonna wanna talk about it. If you've got a product or a service that is worth talking about, people will talk about it. So put a lot of effort into building the best you can build, but don't worry about adding all the fluff and all the extra stuff. Find that core minimal viable product and build it the best you can. Make it as exciting as possible. Make it something that people are gonna talk about. Because once you have that, you can always add more features. You can always add love and fresh scent and paint it blue and do other things down the line, but you got to start with, with a good product that people want to talk about. The other thing that I've really seen a lot of people make the mistake is, is they do things, spend too much money too fast. I'm going to run out and I'm going to, you know, produce a warehouse full of this stuff. You know, I had one, person that I could not help. She came to me after she had already produced a product. She had produced this product. It should be selling in like a Walmart or a, or a CVS or Walgreens. And what she found is, is, you know, she did everything right. She built a great product. It was made in the USA. She was proud of the fact that she didn't have to produce it overseas. It was better than anything else on the market. And she produced it for about $4 a unit. The problem with it is, is that Walmart and CVS and Walgreens wanted to sell it for $4 a unit. So she produced a whole boatload of these things before she even knew how much people were willing to pay for it, and especially the target market. You know, she could have probably continued to sell it as a niche product and made a good living with it. But her original vision for this was it was going to sell in every single, you know, store and on the health and beauty aisle of every single store. And she made a critical error of not knowing how much people were going to put buy it. So that gets back to my next thing is, which is fail often and fail fast. Do things where you can recover from it quickly. Like I said, with those guys with the brewery, produce as little as possible and see if people like it. Because if people hate that, IPA you just produced or that stout you did, you'll know it. But if you've got, you know, a warehouse full of it, you're going to be sitting on it. And that's money that you could use somewhere else. So, you know, have that minimal viable products, have those small things that you can do and fail often and fail fast, you know, test constantly, constantly get the product in people's hands, constantly look at, you know, are, is there a demand for this? Do people have this products? You know, and, and pivot. Don't get so tied up in uh, this is what I wanted my product to be. This is what I wanted my dream to be. And you get a tunnel vision. And, and we all do it as, as the founder or the inventor. We say, this is what it's supposed to be. But sometimes your product gets hijacked by the, by the customers. You get customers that you never thought would buy it. You know, look at the, the boot manager for an old reference. Look at the boot manager, Doc Martin. You know, Doc Martin boots were not, you know, marketed originally to the people who tend to wear Doc Martin boots. They were picked up by a culture. They became part of that culture. And, you know, they, you know, Malcolm Gladwell talks about it in his book, The Tipping Point. You know, it was, there was all of a sudden that brand was hijacked by a community. But guess what? They made a lot of money selling a lot of sho shoes that way. So if you start seeing that your product is going in a different direction and a community is picking it up, you may want to embrace that. You may want to jump on, you know, a subculture or, you know, a group of people that you never thought was going to buy it. You know, just because you thought that, you know, 40 year old women were going to buy it. And then you realize that 20 year old males all of a sudden start liking the product. I don't know why, but they do. And let's run with it, you know, and tweak your branding, tweak your message, tweak your whatever and embrace those customers. Don't get that tunnel vision of, I have to sell it to this particular person. 
you know, at, at some time your brands and your products become not yours anymore and they become your customers. And that's even more now in the social media age, you know, people embrace your products and your services and they make them their own and they talk about them out there. You know, just go and look at any, you know, product on Amazon, you know, people love it and people hate it, but most of those products are now got loyal followers that, you know, want to buy it over and over again, especially the ones with, you know, a lot of good reviews. The other thing is, is use as much off the shelf stuff as you can. So if you're an inventor tinkering, if you can go and get little parts from Home Depot or somewhere to build it in your garage, to try it out and see if people can, can use it, do it. Don't spend a lot of time and a lot of money on, you know, a fancy prototype because it's going to change. And so when you start having molds built and stuff like that, it gets expensive. So the cheaper you can do stuff and the more you can use off the shelf stuff, whether that be using off the shelf stuff to build your website, the things like Wix and, you know, website tonight on GoDaddy or whatever, getting stuff out there, get it out there as fast as possible and then build from there. You can always get more fancy with things and you can always build more but you want to make sure that it's going to work before you spend a lot of money building a product or a service that people may or may not want, or that you're going to have to change later. You, know, you don't want to spend a whole bunch of time building this whole custom e-commerce platform for your business and realize that the demand just isn't there for it. And you've wasted a heck of a lot of money. And that gets to my last thing is conserve as much cash as possible. Spend, spend, as wisely as possible on things that'll get you further. You know, there are certain things that you shouldn't skimp on, you know, always have a good, always have a good lawyer, always have a good accountant, always have good advisors, um, re, always spend on research if you have to, um, but spend wisely. You know, I, I, I was a the web development during the dot-com era. And I saw so many companies that bought Herman Miller chairs and pinball machines and stuff. And, and they were out of business in six months because they spent money on things they didn't need to spend. You don't need a fancy office. Use a space like, you know, Tooney and, and, and they're over at District Hall. Come here to Sprout. I, I'm a member here at Sprout. There's so many good places to rent conference rooms and, and, and use the space. Um, work out of your garage, work out of your basement. Um, especially nowadays in COVID, it really doesn't matter where you are because everybody's on, on teleconferencing anyways. So spend your money wisely so that you can, when you need to, put it towards that marketing budget to meet those customers and those things that you need. So that's my thoughts. Does anybody have any questions on customers and products and getting your product to market? Yeah. Um... With regard to biotech, you know, and uh, pivoting into the COVID area, do you have any uh, general things, uh, pieces of advice for people that are in biotech or diagnostics that need to pivot? Talk to somebody like Richard. Um, That's me. <laughs> no, um, always, you know, bio biotech, I have dabbled in biotech. Richard and I uh, go back to the Mansfield Bioincubator. I was a mentor over there for a little while, but... Um, find people who know that stuff. And you know, I will always defer to other people in other areas. Um, but, you know, as far as pivoting is concerned, you know, we're in a time frame where everybody has had to pivot some way, shape or form in their business. And so what I've been saying since the beginning of, of the COVID, I've done a number of town halls with people from all different kinds of businesses is, um, Go back to why you started your business. Go back to what you tried to be and what you wanted to be. And then don't look at the pandemic and don't look at what's going on as a negative, like I can't do this anymore, but look at it as I can. Um, you know, there's a, there's a great philosophy in um, improv comedy, which is never say no, always say yes and. You know, always go out there and say, all right, well, this thing is coming at me. I'm going to say yes to it. And then, because if I say it's raining and, you know, and Beth Carter goes, no, it's not raining, Dave. Where do we go on that scene? But if Beth says, yes, Dave, and it's raining gumdrops, 
She just said yes, and now get Beth not want to talk about the weather. She wants to talk about gumdrops, but she is now taken into another place. And I think the one thing that we've all learned from the pandemic and pivoting is, is we all have to yes and. We have to go, yep, I can't go into work today and I'm gonna do it this way. Or yep, that market dried up. Or yep, this new market has opened. Um, so I guess, you know, my advice to the biotech world, not being someone of an expert in that area is, Try and figure out where are people needing your skills and services? Where are people needing your products? And how can you reinvent yourself and tweak yourself to, to yes and what's going on in the situation? Thanks, Dave. We'll connect soon. Yep. Um, I think John had a question. Yeah. Uh, well, I was just going to convey a, a situation I had with regards to one of my um, inventions. And uh, like you said, go to the uh, Walmart or go to the Home Depot or what have you. Um, I, the main uh, component in my system was basically a uh, Tesla turbine. Are you familiar with the turbine, the Tesla? Oh, anyway, it's a blade, bladeless turbine. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was only six inches in diameter. And uh, the thing was it fit you know those little Heineken keggers, the yep. uh, little tiny ones? I got two of those and cut them in half because I needed the, the center hole because I, I couldn't punch a center hole. Put a bearing in there, put the turbine disc in there. And then basically the idea was to be, show how it ran uh, as part of my thermal energy converter. And my working medium was going to be um, uh, alcohol 151 go to the liquor store, get 151 rum, Everclear, or something like that, heat it up, and run the turbine. That would demonstrate that it'll run like an alternator or a generator or stuff, because this little tiny unit, weight, weight only five pounds, can output, uh, according to Tesla, uh, 25 horsepower. So it, it was already real compact, real small profile. And the idea was, it was my first show here in, in the islands when I got home. And um, the idea was because the kegger is a stainless steel and uh, the uh, blades itself were stainless steel, I was going to run like Everclear or like 151 rum. And if an investor came along and gave me a check, we, I could drain it off. We could toast to our success. There you of go. course, it, of course, if I failed miserably, I could still drain it off and drown in my sorrows. <laughs> there you go. And, and that's that was the way I pitched example. it. Yeah, I mean, that's a perfect example of using things that are off the shelf. You know, can you rip a hairdryer apart and get a part out that you need? Can you, I did. You know, and that's and that's that's the thing. Why go out and have somebody build you this complex thing? Now, granted, that piece out of a hairdryer might not be exactly what you need, but it's close enough to get you to be able to test and to get people to try it, you know, and to be able to give it to your next door neighbor to, you know, blow their leaves or whatever your, your invention is going to do, you know, so, you know, that's, that's what, that's what I'm saying. Don't spend a lot of, a lot of money, you know, you haven't got a lot of, of resources, you know, and it's really easy to say, oh, I'm going to go out and get a whole bunch of investors, but it's much easier to get investors and, you know, and the people on the call that, that work with investors more, it's easier to get investors when you have a working thing that you can show to them and you can show that, you know, and I showed it to these people and they used it for six months and it worked really well. And, you know, and, and I, and I've, you know, maybe opened a Kickstarter campaign of, you know, and I've got, you know, a thousand people, 2000 people, hundred thousand people that are interested, you know, when Kickstarter started, it was a gentleman who he had invented um, the iPod nano was a small, the small little uh, player. And he invented a thing to put on a watch band so that it became a watch, which is the precursor to, you know, the Apple watch and, you know, um, Fitbits and all of that kind of stuff. And he tried to sell it to Apple, this idea for this watch, he patented it or whatever. Apple kicked him out and said, we don't want anything to do with it. He went, he was one of the first people that really did well on Kickstarter. He sold 300,000 units. All of a sudden, Apple stepped up, took notice, bought it from him. He never delivered one of them, made millions because Apple bought all those customers and the idea and went on to make that band for the iPod Nano. 
So, you know, can you do something like that? Can you get an interest where if your whole idea is to sell it to a bigger company or to get investors to come in and give you the capital to go after the big market, can you get that interest ahead of time? I have one other thing about that same unit, but I had a bigger one when I first started. God, it's been 30 years ago. Well, anyway, um, it was a 13 inch turbine and my mistake was I didn't, I was a, I'm a retired firefighter engineer. So I knew the expansion and flow of, you know, of hydraulics. And uh, I kind of mistakenly used the pressure cooker and to get the physical model to show somebody, a pressure cooker puts a little bit of water in it and capped both of the uh, uh, relief valve and the, the gate, uh, the, um, what you call the uh, rocker or, the rocker thing right at the top. So both little pukas, the, both little holes, vents were closed. One had a valve, one had the, had, had, had the pressure, uh, uh, pressure valve, and when the other one had the flow pressure valve. Well, I didn't realize that anything over 17 pounds in water is high pressure. And I wanted to go for super expansion. And yeah, it expanded so much, I blew myself up. Well, not totally up, I blew me out of the way. And uh, um, I couldn't have the prototype to take to this event. And I was all scarred, I had burns and, and everything. And being just retired from the fire department, it was my shift and so they, first. they had to come. <laughs> Safety first, as John has just taught us. All yeah, right. Yeah. Does anybody else get any other everything? Anybody else got any other questions about their ideas or their products or anything that I said? Any other? Anthony, you want to chime in? You always have good questions for me. Yeah, I guess you know, Dave. What, one of the things I think that uh, I've heard over the years is that entrepreneurs um, sometimes uh, spend so much time refining they're deliverable. And you talked about that, that MVP, that minimum viable product. Um, how important is it to put an A plus uh, product out there, you know, or, or let's revisit when you said, Hey, let's get something out there where you can add the, you know, the lemon scent, you could make it better. So, so I, I guess, are you recommending to put a B product out there and then build it up? Or are you, you know, you recommending, Hey, you know, if you're going to put the B product out there, be ready to get it to an A plus pretty quickly. What I'm recommending is don't try to put too many things onto it and find out what is the A minimum viable product. You know, so many times people, you know, are, are really trying to add so much to it. And, and, and at times it, it actually cripples them from getting it to market or it adds to the cost or whatever. So no, I'm not saying to put out a lesser product, but really ask yourself what, what is really necessary by, for, for the consumers to in, embrace this product. You know, what is the minimum thing that I need to do? Because you can add features to it, you know, especially, you know, I see it a lot in, um, in software, you know, or apps development or whatever, you know, we can add this and we can add that. And, you know, you never get to ship it. You know, um, one of my, um, you know, people that I read a lot is um, Seth Godin and he talks about, you know, just ship it, get it out there. You know, and I think that's what I'm talking about, you know, is, is, you know, you put your best foot forward, but don't get caught up so much in the details and in the weeds that you just never get it out there or you end up spending, so much money on, you know, your, your early versions. Um, and there's a difference between getting it into the marketplace and releasing it to the marketplace at whole, you know, you can, these days you can, you know, sell things so, you know, niche and, and find customers small that getting that less complicated version of your product out there to see what people think of it before you add to it. It also gets you kind of that traction so that when you do go to a, for, you know, an investor or you, or you, you decide to, you know, even if you have your own capital to do it and you decide to go to full scale production, you know, that it's, it's going to work and people need it. Dave, I have a question. Yeah. So, you know, let's say everything you've, all the advice you've given tonight has been excellent. 
But where I think I see entrepreneurs tripping up is, is the messaging. You know, you, you might have a really good product, but if you can't present it, and I'm not saying necessarily even to, you know, to investors, but even just the messaging behind, you know, your advertising or, or social media, whatever you're doing, you know, what's your thoughts on that? Because I think people do get tripped up on that. You have to remember, and I think a lot of the reason why entrepreneurs get tripped up on it is you have to remember that what people see in your product isn't always what you see in your product. So you have to really, and that's why when I talked about going out there and researching using, you know, the, the, those tools in Google and Facebook and stuff, um, what, what is the problem? You know, your, your product, your service is a solution to someone's problem. And so I think the messaging has to focus around real world problems that people have, you know, and so as you're developing your messaging, you need to think about that, you know, why are people wanting this, you know, and, and the problem isn't necessarily just, I need to, you know, get grime off my floor. It could be, you know, I'm looking for self-esteem and, and luxury and, you know, so, you know, clothing and stuff, you know, has, so, so a problem isn't just an actual problem problem. It can also be, you know, how people feel about themselves or whatever, you know? Um, so you really have to understand why is the customer going to buy this? Um, and if you want a good trip through, you know, how advertising and messaging goes, and I just I just watched um, or I'm in the process of watching the final season of, of Mad Men, you know, look at look at how things were done in the 50s and 60s, you know, because they, you know, they really did look at, you know, in some of those episodes, they looked at why do people buy things, you know, and, you know, there's there's nothing, you know, we've got all these new tools, but there's nothing different than when, you know, Peggy Olson was standing in the parking lot talking to the woman who had just bought her burgers at the Burger Chef, you know. Um, understanding your customer is going to be your number one way of then crafting a message as to why they're going to buy your product or service. And I think your comment about how you, how a product evolves and getting the basic product to the market before you start adding enhancements is about allowing your customer to tell you the direction the product should move in, right? I mean, yeah. it's sort of the it's sort of the Swiss army knife Leatherman approach, which is, you know, I may think that it should have this additional enhancement, but the market will tell me better. Well, and the other is if you're going for investors and stuff, they're going to help you determine, you know, you, you know, as you start taking on investors and getting people on your boards and stuff like that, they're going to have con connections into industries and they're going to know ways and they're going to give you ideas of how your products or services can be used in other ways, which if you've got too many things already added, that those opportunities might not be there and you might not actually get those people that are going to jump on your team or, or invest in your product too. But Dave, could you talk a little bit, I think we sort of jumped from the concept of the, the prototype base uh, to the minimum viable product to con, you know, customer, because in my mind, those are, those are the different stages because yep. you're generally going to need some capital to get to that second stage. So you're not producing, you're not providing the minimal viable product really when you're trying to raise money. You've got to have something that's credible that you can get there. Right. right. Yeah. I mean, and it really depends upon how much capital you're going to need. And, you know, and, and, you know, do you have a small, you know, Main Street brewery or are you trying to be the next Budweiser, you know, that kind of thing, you know, and, and in your industry, and I'm using that as a, as a metaphor, but um, yeah, you know, it's, you really, there's stages in all of it and you're going to need some kind of capital to go from the next, whether that be your own personal capital to take you from that garage prototype that you sh shared with your neighbors to up to an actual where you're working with an industrial designer and prototypers to build some for you and build that first run of product that you maybe sell off to a, a you know, a small niche closed market to, to test your product. 
you know, and then you're going to get up into your actual production runs. And that's when you're going to need some serious capital to do it. You know, mo you know, what stops a lot of the inventors I work with is cost of molds. I mean, one mold for one piece of one product can be $50,000, $100,000. You know, molding, to create molds to make things out of plastic or silicone or whatever, that's a huge investment. So you really need to, you know, try and use, like John had said, things that you can buy at a Walmart to see, it, it, does this thing work and can we use it before you actually want to go to a mold? Because once you buy a mold, you're not going to want to change it a lot. You're going to want to- Watch the second, watch the second hand shops too. Yeah, second hand shop, you know, go, go, in, go out there and find things that you can use and try to use as little resources as possible because you can always go and ask for, for money and you can always scale up. Um, but, you know, if you, if you have a, a built-in market or you have a, a product that's working really well that people can get excited about um, at a low cost, it's going to be, it, you're, you're going to have to conserve the cash to then be able to use for the next subsequent things of going to actual prototypes and then to, you know, to, to the product that's going out to market. What kind of advice would you give to somebody who maybe is developing something that doesn't have any strong IP protection and thinks that this is all about, um, you know, the, getting to market first and, and widely? I hear that a lot, which is yeah, I've, got to, I've, got to, I've got to go everywhere, which is, of course, costly to go everywhere. Right. I mean, it really depends upon what it is, you know, I mean, you know, an app in the app store, you know, once you get it out there, you know, theoretically, you have all, all of iPhone users and all of Android users or whatever, but, you know, getting market domination costs a lot of money, and it's, it's hard to do. And Unless you can, unless you create something that people jump on and, it, and you get a lot of viral free excitement. And that's when I talked about building that community because the more you have a community, the more chance that it is going to grow viral and organically and, and you get out there. Um, but, you know, it's hard to be the Kleenex. It's hard to be, you know, you know, and it also depends upon what you want to do too. I mean, you know, there's a lot of business models, especially people that say they want to do that, where they want to be bought by the Ubers and the Googles and the whatever of the world. So if that's your model, then your product isn't really your, I mean, I just saw yesterday, uh, Drizzly, the alcohol delivery service got bought by um, Uber um, for some crazy amount of money, you know. Um, you know, if you wanted to go that route, and you know you're going to want to sell to an Uber someday, then the business itself is your product, not the alcohol delivery service, the, sub the subscribers. Um, I just watched the, uh, the Social Dilemma, which is a documentary on Netflix on social media and stuff. And, you know, one of the engineers from one of, uh, he was with Google or Twitter or something at one point, and he said, if you're not paying for the product, then you yourself are the product. And, you know, us as users, those eyeballs are actually the product for that business. And so in the case of Drizzly, you know, yeah, I, I, ordered, I ordered alcohol from them or somebody ordered alcohol from them, but we're the product because they were ultimately looking to sell to a bigger company and they just wanted those subscribers. So you also have to think about that too. Talk to anybody who went on Robinhood. Yep, <laughs> exactly. Anybody else got any more questions? Oh, I have a question. Hi, real quick. This is Candace. And it's a simple question. When do you know when you've reached the precipice and when do you decide what your limit is and it's time to get financing? And I know it's such a basic question, but when do you say, okay, that's it. That's it for my own finances. Now is the time. I'm actually going to defer to my friend Anthony on that because I usually call people like him when they have that question. <laughs> You know, I think every situation is different and you've got to look at it from what the product is, what the what the need is, um, what your personal wealth situation is. So there's not a right answer there. Um, I, I think the one thing I would tell you is uh, in, in line with this presentation tonight, you, you don't want to be 
spinning your wheels searching for financing. So the, the best thing I, I would say is you always want to have a timeline of when you think you're going to be ready and work backwards from it. Because the one thing I would say is if you think you're going to need money in the third quarter next year, you don't just all of a sudden decide one day, hey, I'm going to go out and raise funds. It takes time. You've got to have all the necessary information pulled together as well as um, the connections. So I, I'd almost say early is always better, but always be prepared that it's going to take longer than you think it is. And you're going to spend more time chasing dollars than you want to, which puts you in the position of, are you better off spending time refining your product or are you better off chasing dollars? And it's, it's a balance. There's no right answer. And it really depends upon how much money you have yourself or your group of, of you know, friends and family that you, you are helping you get this off the ground and how much time and expertise you have. You know, if you can do a lot of it yourself, you need less funds, you know, but if you're going to need to hire people, then you're going to need to get financing sooner, you know? So it's really, you know, it's a, it's a factor of, how much can you do on your own and you know how much and when are you going to need the money and like anthony said everything when you're an entrepreneur takes longer than you think it's going to so take any plan that you have and double or triple the amount of time that you think it's going to take to do it because it's always going to take longer to find that investor or to get that prototype made or to do any of those kinds of things everything it's it's like building a house or remodeling your house it always takes longer than you think it's gonna and more money Dave, I thought one of the things you said is really important is this idea of building a, a, a community or a following or whatever you want to call it. Um, but one of the things I see a lot of times with entrepreneurs, particularly with something where they may not have strong IP protection, is the fear of telling anybody about it until they're ready to go. Um, and then when they're ready to go, they're sort of you know, walking into a void. Yeah. Any advice on how to balance those two? It's the battle between me, the marketer, and you, the lawyer, Peggy, is when, when, do you, when is it risky to tell people and when is it okay to tell people? And that's always... It's not I, a battle with me. I usually tell them that they put five more of a premium on how, you know, on, on how important confidentiality is than it probably is. Um, but that's hard, you know, but, you know, if you're wrong, you know about I mean, that, it's, it's that whole idea of, how do we, yeah, how do we protect versus how do we get people excited? And, exactly. you know, and, yeah. and I've had, I've had projects that were killed by non-disclosures because, you know, the, the investor wants to know everything and the inventor's like, I'm not telling them anything. And, and, and it died on the vine because no one was willing to budge on how much they were going to tell versus how much they weren't going to tell and what they had assigned before. You know, I mean, I've seen legal documents kill financing from investors, you know, and, so, and, and, or, or and prototypers, you know, yeah. prototypers are like, I'm not going to assign that. And then, you know, I mean, it's so, you know, what I always try to say to people is we all have our own businesses and, and, you know, and it's, it's hard enough for you to do it nobody else is going to potentially jump out and exactly. do it. I mean, I think, that, I think it's a little different when you're going to talk to somebody who's so strategic in your space and you might be a little more, but you're absolutely right that the investor community in general, that's not their business. That's not what they want to do. And they're not going to spend the blood, sweat and tears that an entrepreneur will spend on that idea. So I tend to think that they're, oh, you know, they worry about it too much unless of course, they're going to somebody who has an entire design group that could take the idea and run with it. And that's it. You know, if you're you're approaching, you know, if you've got a software idea and you're approaching Google, yeah, you better be protected pretty good because you're not going to walk out of there with any of your IP left if you're not, you know, or, you know, and, and, and you know, in, um, in the biotech world, you know, I mean, those kinds of things that the intellectual property is huge, but, you know, your average inventor, you know, there are protections you should have and you should have a good lawyer and talk to them but you also can't be afraid of telling people out there because people are going to help you get further than you're going to potentially have somebody steal your stuff richard do you want to weigh in you should you, yeah. you... <laughs> uh, actually the thing of it is is that you know with biotech everything is process driven you know uh, and it's very procedural as to how you do things so you can get intellectual property on indication 
what you're trying to treat, how you're doing it, what model clonal antibodies, but what it really comes down to is whether or not you're successful. Can you make it work? Can you succeed you in trials? So, but I mean, you're right. I mean, intellectual property agreements in biotech are huge, very long, hard, you know, to enforce. It depends, it comes down to uh, which lawyer you, know, you got. Uh, for example, um, Wilbur Wright, you know, was suing Curtis, you know, for the airplane. Eventually he won, but he died before he can get any benefit. Yeah. You know, if, um, if Tesla, you know, had a good lawyer, he'd be getting the ro royalties from Marconi over the radio. So it comes down to whose lawyer is bigger, you know, who has the stronger claim and when do you file it and what do you file? You can get it on patent, you can get it on indication, composition of matter, process, concept. We actually do have, we're working with some European I, you know, P lawyers as well that deal with biotech. Talk to us if you like, but it comes down to documentation and your willingness to enforce it. No. And that's the other big one. You can protect everything, but if you don't have pockets to, to go against somebody, it's not even worth the paper it's written on because if you can't fight it then or protect it, then you, you, you know, and I'm not a lawyer and I do not just- No, you're right, but I think that is one reason why entrepreneurs are so nervous about disclosing notwithstanding an NDA because right. they've been told that it's only as good as your pocket, you know, your ability to, right. to, to enforce it and enforcing any kind of IP agreement is incredibly expensive. But I'll tell you the consequences for breaking an NDA. You break trust, you know, that gets, you know, over to everyone. We always start, you know, with NDAs because we tell our clients, we want to know what keeps you up at night. We don't even release the names, you know, of our clients to anyone. Well, how do you get the references? Well, that's just tough, you know, because we've been scooped, we've been scammed by clients. We honor those because we want our clients coming to us you know, with, you know, the information that we need and to be open and honest with them. So it's the ethics, you know, you know, that it's important to us. And that's the thing, you know, being willing to talk to people is going to be more of a benefit than a hurt. You know, it takes, it takes a village to get things to market and you need, you know, as many people on your side as possible. You need your, you need your attorneys, you need your, your prototypers, you need your, your marketing people. And so, you know, that's, that's the other thing. And that's why I deferred to Anthony, you know, it's, you need people who know people because you never know what you're going to need. And sometimes you don't even know what you're going to need as you're getting to market. So the more you can talk to, you know, people like Peggy and Anthony and myself and, and Richard who have done this kind of stuff in these various spaces, the more you're gonna get connected up with the right people and they're gonna help you to be successful. So yeah. you know, that's that's the other big thing is don't go it alone. You know, yeah, start in your garage, play around with it, do you what you have to, but then get out there and start building a community of people, not only from the customer side, but also from the, the provider side that's gonna help you get this thing across the finish line. Yeah, Dave, you know, also it that's our um, story too, you know, in Cernius. This is not an advertisement, but it's some advice. Uh, it does take a village and you don't have to, if you can't penetrate Providence, Boston, Bonn, Paris, London, La Jolla, Boston, there are lots of secondary cities. You have to be willing to talk to uh, manufacturers in Lenox, Kansas, Huntsville, Alabama, Sendai, Japan, Promesia, Italy, you know, secondary cities that have good tech transfer programs. Boston's wonderful, but maybe too popular and you may not get you know, the, you know, the address you need. So you have to be creative in finding the right, you know, fellow villagers, you know, to, you know, put the product together. And you have to learn to be a good project manager, not just, you know, develop tunnel vision. And that's a big one is, you know, a lot of founders get that, that tunnel vision founder syndrome. It's my thing. It's my, I created this. And, you know, at some point you need to let your baby go and you need to just kind of let it take a life of its own. You know, anybody that has, 
you know, had a child and, you know, they're going through the teenage years and then off to college and stuff. At some point, you know, they, you, you need to let them make their own mistakes. And in some, some ways, you know, especially if you have a team of people working with you, either outside consultants or investors, or, or even you've hired people in, you know, at some point it becomes, takes its on its own life. And, you know, that, that thing you, you thought of that that brainchild that you have that's great but now it's it's something completely different and it's time to let the let the marketplace take it and embrace it and do something with it anybody else with thoughts questions any any smaller businesses out there people who are you know got smaller products and services that are on that wanted any kind of advice Allie has a question Allie go ahead Allie um, my question actually goes back to a couple of your bullet points. You had mentioned, um, you know, build your tribe, your community. And then you mentioned something about going viral and how it's a lot harder than, you know, what most people think, but I couldn't remember what the rest of your thoughts were. I was just taking some notes on it. Well, you know, everybody, everybody, I want my video to go viral. I want everybody to, you know, I'm going to create this thing that gets out there and, you know, create good content, have a good product, and it's going to go where it goes, you know, and you can prop it up a little bit by, you know, trying to, you know, get your community to spread the idea and stuff. But in the end, the marketplace is going to determine whether your message and your product is going to hit at home. And that's why, you know, you really need to test as much as possible and, 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 and conserve as much resources because you never know where things are going to go and what is going to work as far as, you know, whether it be the product itself or the messaging that you're putting out there. Um, so, you know, it, 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 all the, all the best plans for marketing and making things, you know, catch on and go viral, all go out the window when it hits the marketplace. Cause it's, it's the market determines whether they like it or not. Thank you. Hey, Dave, I think that strategy goes to for many years um, when I sit down with entrepreneurs and we sit down with the, the money folks, um, hope is not a strategy to get your business off the ground or, you know, advertising that's going to come is not a, a, a valid revenue stream. You have to know, you have to have a plan on how you're going to get from point A to point B or how you're going to make revenue or how you're going to get customers. And, you know, they don't want to hear the, I think this is what's going to happen. You, you get kicked out of the room immediately. And my other favorite one is there's a billion people that could use this. And all we need is 1.1 one hundredth of a percent. And we're all going to be millionaires anyways. That's like your number one reason to get kicked out of the room. You know, say I'm going after these. 50 people, these 100 people, these 1,000 people to prove the market, and then I'm going to go after the next 100 people. And that's the kind of strategy that's going to get you funding, get you success, get you proof of concept, all of that kind of stuff that, you know, oh, it's a huge market, so why wouldn't I be successful isn't really a, a good way of, uh, it, it goes on that hope strategy. Well, we've covered a lot tonight, Dave. I can't thank you enough. I think people got a lot out of tonight and hopefully they can uh, use it all. Um, so thank you very much. Um, Dave, you wanna share your screen or show everyone how they can get in touch with you? Terrific. And I run um, office hours every Wednesday at noon. I do 15 minute sessions just for anybody that has a quick question and wants to chat. Um, feel free to send me an, an email at dave at the brain for rent .com and I can set you up with a 15 minute time slot on any particular Wednesday. Excellent. That's wonderful. I hope everybody takes advantage of that. That's a very nice offer. Well, again, Dave, this was really interesting and I think everybody got a lot out of it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Beth and Anthony and Dave and Peggy. You guys were awesome. We love sponsoring this.